I go to the theater, if I can see the acting, I already don't like it. In other words, if it's the performer and his mind and his speculations and what he fixes and arranges is visible to me, it's bad acting, in my opinion. When I believe that there's a human being in action up there, in that moment, alive, right there and then, I get spellbound. Now, to achieve that is, to me, harder than playing an instrument. It's harder than fiddle, than, uh, it's harder than dancing, it's harder than all the other performing arts, in my opinion. When you really achieve that understanding of human beings, that ability to place yourself into the, into the shoes of another human being and reveal that life on stage, it's to me the ultimate experience. When I first began, Herbert had a studio and he said, why don't you join us? I said, first of all, I was 27 years old. I said, I don't know how to teach. And he said, you know how to act, share what you have learned. Well, that was to me such a wonderful way of approaching it. What I learned as a teacher is to select for the individual actor each time he works, two or three things he can work on that will take him ahead a little bit. In other words, you can tell an actor everything and they don't know where to begin. They leave in confusion, so I haven't helped them at all. So to really selectively go for what will further their individual problems and solve them for them is what's taken me a lifetime to learn. Set up, please. Two for the seesaw. First of all, when you watch your fellow colleagues working, don't be judgmental. Don't say, oh, I like his work, or I like, don't like her work, or he you know, your own. It, it teaches you nothing. If you really watch and identify with it, if something is convincing, ask yourself why. What are they doing that, that is allowing for that? If you don't believe it, say, that's wrong. That's what I do. How can I correct that? And so that even when you listen to me, you listen for your criticism, not just theirs. Then your participation in any, every scene will not be just as an audience, but will be an active learning one for each of us. There isn't a mistake that you make that I haven't made over and over and over again. And it is out of acknowledgment of those errors and trying to correct them that we all learn something and grow together. Look, Jerry, why don't we just sort of uh, get married and get the goddamn thing over with? Bigamy? Oh, big of you, I mean. I've got one wife now. Yeah, I mean, after the divorce. I'm not just going to be a ball and chain, you know. Now that you passed your bar exam, you know the first thing I'm going to do? Take up shorthand. Oh, well, shorthand is the one thing this romance is lacking. <laughs> so when you open up your law office, there I am, a goddamn secretary. You're really going to save dough on me. And, and, and once I make enough money out of the law, I'm going I'm to fix up the flat for us real nice. It's real nice. It stinks. What do you want to buy this stuff, Jerry? Bills. Gas, phone. Leave them somewhere I can see them. I don't think I've paid those yet. What do you want to pay them for? All we can do is shut you down if you do if you don't. Ooh, letters. Jerry, dearest, don't shut me up. Although the plaintiff has conducted herself as a true and faithful wife to the defendant, the said defendant has been guilty of acts of cruelty toward the plaintiff, destroying the peace of mind of the plaintiff and the objects of matrimony. It is hereby ordered, adjudged, and decreed, decreed by the court that the bonds of matrimony heretofore existing are severed and held for naught, and that the said plaintiff is granted an absolute divorce from the defendant. Why did 
didn't you tell me, Mary? I had to live with it a little longer. You didn't want me to know? Not till I was on top of it. Never's a deep hole. It takes a long time to close over. Then what'll you do? Then? Yeah, then? <coughs> Take things one day at a time. What? Pack these cups. You son of a bitch! Did you, did you, did you tell her about me? That you moved in? Yes. Because I had a hemorrhage? I'm not a son did of a Did you tell bitch. her I had a hemorrhage? Yes! And you didn't tell me about this? Okay, I'm going to start every uh, uh, criticism with your own evaluation of what you just did. Self-evaluation is as much a learning process of acting as anything else. And there is, no matter how deeply involved we are in the material that we're working on and uh, uh, how much we seem to be in it, every <coughs> actor, and you all know this, has what I call the sixth sense, some little clicker that says, oh, what, that worked well, no, that didn't. Why didn't this work? Oh, they're getting restless. I better hurry up. Oh, they laughed on the wrong line. <laughs> we know these things. So instead of saying, what does somebody else think? What do I think? And it'll take you a while, but it can be developed as a, as a very special needed skill, right? So good, bad, or different doesn't have to be brilliant. Just, how did you feel about what just happened? Adam. Uh, <coughs> getting into it, I felt, and it's just easy to say, I guess, I'm in and out of it, in and out of it different times. There were times where I really felt that um, we were connecting, and other times where I was trying to remember what we had done previous, trying to adapt the old space to the new space. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot of that kind of in and out. Came from the space. Oh, well, uh, well, not just from space. I mean, the, from your bodily relationship to the space, so yeah. you were... Okay, fine. Yes. Uh, um, Nikki. Um, I felt pretty good for most of it because it felt really new and not as nice. Um, I, I, I felt a lot of trouble at the end um, once I find out. Um, and part of it was like the door meant something to me, and I looked and there was no door. But really, I think I just have a, a difficulty with those moments after. All right. Now, some of this was excellent. Now, the end, it's wonderful that you knew there was something wrong at the end. The, the, the difficulty in it is to know the stages of disillusionment, anger, whatever you want to put on it, and not to judge how much it should move in on you. Work solely for a, whatever you use as a substitution for that psychological sense of betrayal, isn't that what it is? Yeah, yeah. And translate that to this circumstance, to this Jerry, to these lines. Don't determine how it will grow, that it's got to grow, or that it's got to go up and down. Leave it alone and really go, and you, if you open yourself up to only that reality, if you whisper it's okay, if you shout, it's okay. Don't determine which it will be. Emotion is its like a fever chart. It takes us. We can't take it. Almost no emotion goes steadily upwards and then explodes. That's only a dramatic cliche. It, it goes up and down. It can feel, in the middle of the deepest emotion sometimes, uh, you can be almost in shock so that you feel nothing. If you feel nothing, don't say, oh, that's wrong. I should be feeling something. Feel nothing. It, it let what, what moves in on you take you. And out of the nothingness, will, it might come, what? Don't do it. Do you see? But let it. Don't force it. And I think if you leave that open, and at every performance, you should leave it open. You'll mine gold that way. OK? Um, Another thing you did that, was, that got you in big trouble there was that you kept standing. Mm -hmm. Which, I'm sorry, which? 
You told her, but you didn't tell me. Uh, you kept standing there. Yeah. And no. so your whole body, you know, with all these different... I, I, yeah. I, don't. Do you mean sit or just do something? <laughs> Either one. Sit on a box, sit on the bed, sit, uh, uh, go for a book. We do the most illogical things, but we don't just stand. Okay, can I ask a question? Okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes I have, I have difficulty knowing, like in, especially in a moment like this where something takes the character completely by surprise. Isn't it possible that sometimes as a character you are uncomfortable, you are sort of lost in space, you are sort of... No, you're not lost in space. You are uncomfortable and you do all sorts. It's like... Somebody, I say, what were you doing there? I was waiting. I said, well, what were you doing while you were waiting? <laughs> you know, what, what are you doing when you're confused? Not I'm doing nothing. I'm just acting confused. You see, if I say I'm waiting for a subway or I'm waiting for somebody to meet me in a park, right? Now, nobody stands and waits for a subway, <laughs> right? Now, where's the subway coming from? What do you do while you're standing there? How do you make yourself comfortable in relationship to what you're wearing? Who do you see? Uh, when you plan what you're going to say to your agent, what do you do uh, uh, when you, you take another look? You wait for the train. You count the cracks. You start re rehearsing your audition. You do, but you don't stand and wait. <laughs> and you don't... Uh, uh, in trauma, in, 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 a, in a big crisis, you may be confused, but what do you do in your state of confusion? That's what you have to find. Okay? That's very important. Uh, you have some zinger lines all the way through the play. Don't avoid a funny line and say, I don't want to show the audience that this is a joke. We spend three quarters of our lives trying to make people laugh. Right? See if you can make her laugh. Then you have a justification for a comedic line. Right? We do that in life. OK, good. It's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Sit up barefoot in the park, please. In your rehearsals, work on place. I work an hour on place alone in terms of what do I usually do in that room? Where's my favorite place? What's it? If it's a new room to me, I ask my partner, what is in your room? What, what, what do we see outside of these windows? Where's your kitchen? Where's your John? Uh, 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 did your mother make these pillows? I don't know, I'm making this up. But I do all the, inve and not only do I talk about it, but I walk around in it. I touch things. And I sit and see what I would do in this room. And then put the scene on its feet and go moment to moment. Why do you come into the room? What do you see there? Where would you head? Uh, are you invited to sit down? Do you find your own place? Does she take your things? Do I take mine? And in that way, the scene evolves, humanly, logically. Don't you tell me when to cry. I'll cry when I want to cry. And I'm not going to have my cry until you are out of this apartment. Out of this apartment. Well, you certainly don't expect us to live here together, do you? After tonight? Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. I want a divorce. A divorce? What? I'm sorry, Paul, I can't discuss this anymore. Good night. Where are you going? To bed. Corey, will you come in here? I want to know why you want a divorce. I just told you why. Because you and I have absolutely nothing in common. What about those six days at the plaza? Six days does not a week make. <laughs> By that? I don't know what I mean. I just want a divorce. <laughs>
Corey, come here. Why? Because I don't want to yell. <laughs> All the way. Afraid the crazy neighbors will hear us. You're serious. Dead serious. About the whole thing. Going to court, signing the papers, shaking hands, goodbye, finished forever, divorced. That's what I mean. See? So then I guess there's nothing left to talk about. Can you at least take a nap? You don't have to get snippy. Well, damn it, I'm sorry, but when I plan vacations, I'm happy. When I plan divorces, I'm snippy. <laughs> okay. Now, what could you tell me? <gasps> Kevin. Does anything occur to you that I might criticize? An arm movement. I okay, all right, good. Yeah. Um, uh, Melissa. Um, I find it really difficult to start this scene. So, um, although I'm running my objective and my physical goal through my head and trying to <coughs> internalize it in my body, I always feel a little unsteady okay. starting that all right. Now, one of your biggest problems with the scene is that it has no real physical life anywhere. There is standing, there is preconceived line readings, and emotion. There is no physical presence in this room. Uh, let me show you something. I always say we never stand when we can sit. The standing here was continuously placed. If I get up and I'm going to get you a drink, and I hit for the bar, right? And I go here, and I'm, I'm going to get you a drink. Now you say something to me. I can stand here for 10 minutes because when we're through with this, I'm going to go to tomorrow. That's what I mean by destination. We are always between places. If, if you stand over here, it's possible you're confronting him here. Now, your standing is dependent on whether you're going to go to bed, but you know in, internally, instinctively, you know that that's where you're going to end. Or you're going to change your mind and sit down here and have it out with him here. But you're, you never have destinations. That's when you, now you have to fight for relaxation. And your body is fighting to be relaxed. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when you both started, I knew you were both in trouble. Always connect your first beat with an activity, with a physical activity. Take a sock off and then start talking and you'll be better off. Do you see what I mean? If I'm waiting for an entrance, uh, if, if it's no more than an adjustment of my belt just before I come in, I'm more in action than when I'm standing and trying to sift all the homework and who am I and who was my grandmother and what am I doing here and what's it. <laughs> and I say the three steps are, what did I just do? What am I doing now? What do I want? And go for it. Those are the three steps that will get you there. Not body exercises, not relaxation exercises, not workouts, uh, not inner work can get you in glue. You don't know which foot to start with, you know? So if the body isn't there, nothing else. We talk, we feel, we think, but it comes out of our body. So all the thinking and talking and feeling, if the body isn't there, it's useless. Do you see? Mm -hmm. I also think in, in the physical life, it's peculiarly staged, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. You're making determinations on emotional results, on highs and lows in the scene. You haven't really found your reality at this point in this fight, what you would do, what you have to do. Do you see? 
it, I don't care if it seems illogical to you, but don't stick to this layout. Shake it up. Start with the rehearsal of doings and, and uh, activities in this room. OK, that's all. Very good. Uh, work on it some more. Destination is probably the thing that, that I think about the most. I can't tell you how many times people have been like, OK, in this scene, you're going to pace. You're going to be pacing, and you're waiting for the phone call. And I'm like, no, I don't pace. I don't pace because Uda told me not to, not to ever pace, because nobody just walks back and forth without a reason to go one way or the other. The exercises and why I devised them. Years ago, when I worked a lot and played a lot, there were obviously times in between when I had nothing to do. There were many technical problems that nobody seemed able to solve for me, which arose, like suddenly panicking with an awareness of the audience of, uh, what do I do if I have to balance? Suddenly I'm hot and, and, and in a hurry and it's dark. And how do I incorporate all these conditioning forces into my work? So I began working at home by myself. And the first thing I learned was how little we are trained to observe ourselves, our behavior. We can always tell somebody how we feel about something, but what we did when we felt a certain way, we're unable to describe. So I started to watch myself at home in, in a variety of circumstances, and then see if I could bring into being and recreate just two minutes of a simple task while I was at home understanding everything that was the cause of my behavior. The very first exercise, it's called destination. What is my physical destination? When you are spaceless, when you don't know where you are, what surrounds you, where you came from, and where you are heading, your body will tense, you will get very self-conscious, and start to arrange yourselves. If you know where you're going, where you came from, what surrounds you, and how that influences your behavior, you get free. Then all the wonderful work, psychological work you do on character and on, on the uh, movement of the scene can take place. Otherwise, it can't. Judy, how did you feel? the belly laugh when you fixed yourself in the mirror. Do you know why it got such a laugh? 
Um, I, yeah, sure. You do? Well, I mean, I guess so. We all, we all recognize ourselves. Right. That's what brings about the most spontaneous laughter, when we suddenly see ourselves doing the same thing, right? Uh, I felt that the music was wonderful, but you didn't go with it as much as you would if it, the awareness that it's on, you know? The moment there is no problem, or I'm just looking, you will find that you go with it. It's a wonderful thing to discover. You did towards the end, but I felt that could have been more influential. Otherwise, why have it on, you know? You used expletives. Now, I wanted to, do, in the future, when you work on, if you plan to work on these exercises at all, wherever you find that you snort, use an expletive, sigh, cuss, or talk, do it. These are not silent exercises. If, when you start to see where those things come from and how much we do talk to ourselves alone, you're a mile ahead when you get to monologues. OK, very good. All right. Uh, by the way, a two to three minute exercise discovered from your life and worked on should be at least an hour or two rehearsal. OK. The second exercise has to do with that strange sensation I used to have when I wanted privacy on stage, that, that all those three air walls, you don't have three here, you only have one, but if there would be stage wings here, that you have three areas of reality in which you're in conjunction with, and out here is that gaping hole, the audience, who are looking at you. And the how to retain privacy there, not to play into the audience and not to duck from them, but to incorporate this area so that it belongs to your room. By the way, what I'm looking at has to be out of the possibility of eye contact with anybody in the audience. So wherever I anchor that spot, it has to be, let's say, uh, where that white piece of paper is, or on the other side of it, near that little bright spot just above Kyle's head over there. Because every theater shape is different, where the exit signs are, where the balcony, what I'm going to use. I go into the theater way ahead of time when the house is empty, and I mark it first so I'm not hunting for my fourth side while I'm playing. Poppy. It's your daughter, Marjorie. <laughs> what? Marjorie. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, it took me 13 hours. No, the airlines, they said that, they said that I had to spend the night in Salt Lake City, and I said, I'm not spending the night in Salt Lake City, no matter what. And I called customer service from the plane, and they were like, no one's ever called customer service from a plane before. <laughs> and the first one, and Dad, like, all the passengers were staring at me, because they thought I was insane. She's in the pool. Really? I'm so jealous. We had so much fun. Um, you know what I wanted to tell you? I don't think that I'm going to go to um, real estate school right away. No. I know that we talked about it, but um, it's just I'm really concerned that it's going to be uh, hard for me to do both things at the same time. No, not exercise. Act. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just don't how I can really give myself the both things fully, you know. So I'm going to, I know, I, mean, I know. Well, I thought I would maybe work in a bookstore or a pet shop or something, you know. Maybe I could walk to work. It wouldn't be draining. Yeah. Oh, they're good. They're outside, actually. So you got that, right, Dad? You know what I mean about that? <laughs> that means I'm not going to go right now. I know that you, yeah. I don't know. I just know that that's what I have to do. Are you going to go in the pool? Okay. Well, give her my love. And I love you, Pop. That's it. Okay, how did you feel? Oh, it was so anchoring to uh, have that there. It gave me right off the bat something really good. And I really forgot 
for quite a while, not the entire time, that there were people here. Absolutely. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? You see, I always say when that works, it's like somebody took the weights off my shoulder because it makes me free to be there. It was a wonderful exercise. I had one question. Yeah. Did anything bother you? Did anything bother me? Or did it occur to you that strange or anything? It's really strange. Hi, Poppy. This is your daughter, Marjorie. Marjorie. Is he deaf? He is a little, he's slipping. Yeah, he's slipping a little bit. It's a concern that I have. Okay, all right, then I accept it. If it really came from that he didn't grasp that it was you. Right, he, he'll say what, dear? And I'll say Marjorie. You okay, know? fine, I accept it. Then I have no criticism at all, see? <laughs> okay. He's had a marvelous freedom without anxiety. See if you can bring that to your scenes. Okay, well, thank you. good. Set up, uh, Marco. We are, you know, a prism of, of different kinds of, of characters, and we have the capacity within ourselves to understand a whole variety of characters. And you don't try to um, pretend to be someone else, but you find it within yourself and uh, find that different character behavior. And an exercise like the telephone exercise shows you that, that you are three different people depending on who you're talking to. Hello? Okay. Uh, uh, Francesca? Um, Yes, uh, oh yes, you are Francesca, excuse me, uh, <laughs> sorry, yes, okay, are, we, are I supposed to call you? No, okay, there is no problem with me, no, anyway, I had to get up, yes, <laughs> you want me, you're gonna tell me, okay. Holes, whole street between was ten third ten ten yeah okay tomorrow at nine yes I won't forget I wrote down <laughs> yes. excuse me I didn't understand you before. You said uh, this your friend is gonna play my part. Okay, no, there's no problem. No, it's fine with me. Yeah. Okay. So, signorina uh, Francesca, enjoy. See you. Yeah, <laughs> No, this is Marco, manager of the telephone. Who do you want to talk to? Ush? You want to talk maybe to Uros? <laughs> Uros first? Or Lia Pogacnik? They're living here as well? No. Who do you want to talk to? I'm asking you, who do you want to talk to? <laughs> Excuse me. I just wanted to help you. Thank you. Goodbye. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't want to. No, it's not okay. 
you know what I was thinking because this is such a lovely weather outside that uh, I want to sleep a little bit. <laughs> and if we can, so when shall we meet? Uh, I don't know, I have just this appointment at 6 o'clock uh, with Christy, but do you have any rehearsals? So, 12, uh, 1. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes. What? Yeah, I guess so. John? Okay, see you. <laughs> okay. Now, how did you feel? Okay. <laughs> that was very, very good. Now I have a, a number yeah. of things to With say. With waking up again, I think. The waking up, you jumped, you rushed. Yes. What was funny, you got sleepy after you were awake. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But not when you woke. The three different people were wonderful. The first one, the confusion on, on who wanted who. The, um, the, the last one, the girl. I mean, already how you arranged your, your whole body changed when you knew you were going to talk to her, you know. Now again, how is that applicable to the part? Let's say the annoyance, the snottiness he developed in the second one through that person can be applied to character. I say, well, I'm never like that. I'm never, you know, arrogant or uh, pu putting people down. Of course you are, once a day, depending on whom to whom. Now, I can use that as a character element when I am playing a, a rather arrogant, uh, uh, sarcastic, snotty young man or young lady, whatever. Now, this discovery of yourself and all the millions of things you are capable of that goes above and beyond your sense of self, which usually is more cliche than any part you could ever play. You know, I, I say, who do I think I am? I think I'm open, generous, kind, noble, <laughs> giving, uh, so that we have very limited image of ourselves. And the opening up this to the point where when am I silly, when am I stupid, when am I, uh, uh, when am I arrogant, when am I uh, uh, neurotic, when am I everything that I'm called on to play in different parts that aren't right off my center. OK. Now, this was very successful. I have one further criticism. Since the exercises are based on building one on top of the other, I don't expect the other elements to be missing when you come to it. The first exercise, which is destination, you incorporated beautifully. You had unbelievably specific destinations just on this floor. Right? You always knew you were, where you were in relationship to what. The second exercise is a telephone a conversation to one person in which you are to test how your involuntary attention goes on to objects on the fourth side, which is the audience. Did you ever use the fourth side here in this? No. When I was talking uh, in the last, I, uh, like a Windows. OK, all right. And as, uh, just as you did it, I realized you did. But it was at a minimum. Uh, now, of course, when he's on his back, his fourth side is up on the ceiling. You know, it's not going to be, I, and I can't force my attention out there. Just so I should use that more? Yeah. Oh. It wasn't as though you didn't have privacy or as though you were ducking this area, but you are eliminating it a little bit. Mm -hmm. OK? Yeah. All right. Very good, Marco. Thank you. Do you have a question? Shh. Yeah. Yesterday in rehearsal, I was I was playing with expectations, like when I would say something, what I'm hoping she's going to say. And in everyday life, you do have expectations with every moment, but some of them might be 
huge expectations. Oh, absolutely. Some of the, oh, of course. It's not a matter of degree, but there, we never know exactly what's going to come. We expect something, and sometimes we do get what, exactly what we expected, and then we're already on to the next. If I just say to you, uh, uh, how are you? Wonderful. Uh, I, uh, well, it wasn't quite what I expected, so it stopped me a little bit. <laughs> No, but I mean, you see, if I, if I say that to you, what I really want to say to you is, how long did you rehearse on this scene? I, and, it, and it's a jump in, right? Now, if I say, uh, how are you? And the actress is fine. I said, now, how long did you work on this scene? Now, if I say, how are you? And he says, I really have a terrible headache. I say, oh, oh I'm so... Well, yeah, how long did you work on this scene? <laughs> But the, the uh, if I get what I expect, like I'm fine, then I'm already on to what I want to do, uh, the next thing that I want. But uh, you, you'll get the hang of it. You'll start to explore that in your own lives and see how crucial that is to a true give and take. Okay. Just recently I did just a scene um, on my show where I was um, first got the keys to my boyfriend's house. And it was like this big coup that I was able to get the keys from him. And I go to his house and I don't know if he's home yet and I have a present for him. So I was like walking in his house. The camera was following me and I was calling his name. And I remember thinking all about Uta before I did the scene and about place and about expectation and really looking. If you're looking for something, don't just scan. Don't anticipate that. Don't anticipate. It seems like a really big thing. For this exercise, the problem that I give you is that you have lost something. It has to be pretty small so that you can't... I mean, if, if you lost a, a, a big shoe and your set is such, you haven't got many places to look because you would see it. So it has to be a small object, something that is important to you, uh, that you have misplaced or lost. In the rehearsing of it, you will know you put it where you're going to find it eventually. And then it's the problem of really putting yourself into the moment with total conviction so that you don't anticipate and start to play the manner of looking for something rather than really looking. Okay. Okay. Glasses. Books. No. Suck! Oh, Jesus, I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! It's not fair. Um, <laughs> if you were just a little fucking more organized, I would like it a lot better. My ticket, my ticket, what the fuck? <sighs> Breathe. Calm down. <laughs> what can you tell me? Huh. Um, well, maybe a more gradual. No, I felt the talking took over at the expense of really looking. Now, by the way, a side effect of this exercise is that almost always, if you lose something and get panicky, you will start talking to yourself. So it's a kind of nice. 
uh, first step into learning how that comes about. Do you want to try it again? Yeah, just try the, the first few beats again. And if you talk, talk, but don't make that predominant. OK. All right? Specifics of what she's setting up now. Uh, that exercise can't work unless you really know everything you're dealing with, each pile, what's in it, what it means to you. So it isn't just, otherwise, if you would just put stuff there, it would become general hunting. Now again, it, I'm not getting a good idea and then seeing how I can improvise it. In the rehearsing, I'm truly discovering it so that I can repeat it as if for the first time. OK. Makeup, books, glasses. Okay, now you see, that was much better. Didn't it feel better? Yes, it did. You see, the, the test is, it was in the first one also some of the talking came was like, oh my God, it's gone, I'm never gonna find it. So, which prevents a real search. Do you right. follow? Yeah. In other words, the possibility, it's gotta be here, and the real hunt for it, and the, the talking yourself into the, sureness that it must be in that first verse. And then if not, where? It could be there. Oh, no, it's got to be there. In other words, the, the whole thing of expectation in acting, that we expect something. And then we very rarely get exactly what we expect, is put to the ultimate test in this exercise. And you can apply. You saw her do it twice now, all the same activities. When it works, when it's really correct, you and the audience, her heart will start to pound. Who is she ever going to find it? Do you follow? You'll start to care. If it's mechanical, you'll sit and say, oh, she's looking for something. That's funny. Do you know? The, just the second time through was much, much better. OK. Very good. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, inner objects? An inner object is something we contact visually in our mind's eye that is not present in the room. Memories, remember what you did yesterday when you told me such and such. Um, I, I'll show you one of my favorite demonstrations. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to the store. I have to button my coat, right, uh, before I go out. And I'm standing on stage buttoning feeling more and more self-aware, uh, thinking, what is the matter that I can't concentrate on getting on a coat and buttoning it up? So I suddenly, oh, there aren't any buttons on the air. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. So now, <laughs> great demonstration. Now, I, I, I'm buttoning it up, and suddenly I say, why can't I concentrate? Everybody's looking at me. And I think, well, just button the coat. <laughs> right? 
and I'm, oh! Now I say, what, I, uh, what am I getting at the grocery store? I, I need those baby peas. They're always out of those. I need a, uh, some bounty. I bet they only have Scott. And I go with my inner objects, and I'm buttoned, and I don't even know I did it. Do you follow? By contacting my grocery store, the shelves, what they look like, I am then occupied, and I'm in line with going shopping. signing the papers, shaking hands, goodbye, finish forever, divorce. That's what I mean. Huh. And I guess there isn't anything left to be said, is there? I guess not. Right. Good night, Corey. To bed. Don't you want to talk about this? At 2.30 in the morning? I can't sleep until it's settled. Well, that may take three months. Why don't you at least take a nap? You don't have to get snippy. Well, I'm sorry. But when I plan vacations, I'm happy. And when I plan divorces, I'm snippy. This is my just Okay. Now, how did you feel today? Pushing yeah. toward the results that you wanted. Yeah, pushing to have something I didn't. And I don't even know that I knew what that was. But I felt like, oh, I have to, something's not here, I have to find it. So it's very possible that I wasn't connected, but that I was struggling to find that thing. Okay. And uh, Kevin? Um, I found that there are couple of moments that I was just not there. And, it, and it's always the tough moments of the surprise when she says, I want a divorce. It felt, I don't know. You see, it starts earlier, actually. I want you out of here. Yeah. 
you see, and that, that didn't land at all. Your pants were more important than what that meant. Yes. By the way, that's what I want to talk about, that some of your activities, when the activities stay pieces of business, you're using them wrong. In other words, when, when uh, uh, you see, if, if I'm hanging up pants, I'm hanging them over this thing. Now, when this, that they're right, becomes more important than what I'm hearing here, this is not serving you. It doesn't mean that I don't do this. But you see, if I'm doing this, and she says, say to me, I, I, I want you to get out of here. OK, now wait. I want you out of this apartment. What do you mean, out of here? We certainly don't think that, that we're going to live here together, do you, after tonight? Whatever, but then I go on with this. But I don't <laughs> have to finish my piece of business. Do you follow? Yes, yes. Uh, and the, the same with the tooth. You, you, you thought, well, the, I might do that there. So now it becomes the toothbrushing. You stop hearing. You, and you might head here. And you might start that. Then she's saying something. You might never get to it. Do you follow? But when that becomes, then I have to do that. And how does the cap open? And how would I do this here? When, then you stop hearing and connecting. That's why I always say, do all the activities before you ever learn the lines. Yeah, I think that's it started from the beginning. It of would, the it would. Process. It's very hard to shake that, and really, uh, rather than arriving at it organically, so that it's incorporated into the work, it becomes disassociated. You say, I got to do something there, so it becomes a piece of business. Right. Right. And that I felt stopped you a lot. Okay. Very good. Good. I don't know if this is the best time. I'm trying to apply um, your technique of transferences. And, uh, and I've, done, I've gotten as far as finding moments that I think are applicable. And now I don't know what to do with them. Like I can say, OK, I can picture the pajamas that I wear when he goes to work. And I know how they feel. And I know how they make me feel. But what do I do? I don't know how to make that here. Well, have you got them on? Have you got his robe on? I have his robe belt on. So just knowing that's enough. Absolutely, absolutely. But a any transference is, if it makes me feel a certain way, what do I want to do about it? Otherwise, it's just nourishment sometimes. Right, okay. It doesn't have direct application, except that it seems to feed you. OK? OK, All I right. get it. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. When I first learned about transference and substitutions, I remember being very confused as to whether I was supposed to literally like superimpose someone from my life, like a boyfriend or somebody who I loved, over the face of like my scene partner in order to, you know, have the, the correct like emotional investment in that person. And she was like, no, 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 substitution defines behavior. How substitution in relationship to others can change. Let's suppose uh, my sense of age, how young or how old I am, very often depends on whom I'm with. Right? Now, I'm walking down the hall, and I bump into Alfred Lunt. And he reaches out and asks to shake my hand. Now, I'm heading here, and I see it's Alfred Lunt. You know. and, <laughs> I mean, I'm 18 again. That's the, how I feel. I mean, because the, of the admiration about our relationship at that time. Now, I can substitute, if we're playing together, him for you, if I need to. Do you see? Right. And it brings about a totally different. Now, the, the whole point in substitution is that I'm not carrying, as we shake hands, I'm not carrying Alfred Lund around in my head. I'm not playing, you know. Where is he? And that's what he looks like. And that, you know, but I'm I'm transferring that relationship on to you. And when I shake hands with you, I'm doing it to you, right? Not to him anymore. That's where we often screw up in in substitutions. We hang on to the source, and it floats around with us. We're doing homework there, and we don't see who we're doing it with. See, when it's translated into action, into behavior with the partner, our relationship immediately becomes something else. Now, if I take my snotty son-in-law, the same circumstances, all right? And you offer me your hand. OK, here I go. And I go. You see, now, 
<laughs> but I've done it, I've again done it to him, not to my son-in-law. You see, that's the, the step in rehearsal we often leave out. That we imagine, and then we hang on to the imaginative thing rather than putting it on to the object or the person. Right? Okay, very good. Can you tell me? I was really, really nervous. <laughs> and I was definitely watching myself through parts of it. There were parts of it that I really felt no. active in it. And I think definitely more the physical, because I physically am half to trying to get away from him. Um, I've never encountered a man like this before. I've never encountered a man who challenged me. So I think there's times that I, as Kate, don't know what I'm doing. All right. And? Robert. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to achieve most was what you talk about, this elimination of style. And I wanted to be free of that. I didn't want to have it labeled or have it be some sort of a, you know, my notion of a historical construct. And that I felt good about. I had a real problem with the physicality. Um, and I, I think, given more time, what I would like to, you talk also about setting physicality and yet having it be newly alive. And that's what I still feel we need to achieve. Okay. Any physical confrontation on stage has to be worked out like a ballet so that it can be spontaneous. In other words, just slugging or just if it gets dangerous or out of control, first of all, the audience senses that they immediately lose reality and say, oh, that actor is hurting that actor, not Petruccio is attacking Kate. Do you see? Now, the world that say that uh, Kate does limp uh, why did, I mean, she should be up by then. She should be limping. She should be trying to, do you follow? Yeah. It doesn't make sense otherwise. Okay. No, those things you have to. In other words, th this is an aspect of, of, of the, the whole chapter I have on endowment, endowing something with a reality that it doesn't have through uh, uh, physical actions. And in other words, if I have to, if I have to, I have boiling hot coffee and burn, burn myself. I want nice, cool tea or whatever it is on stage. And then I <laughs> endow it with what it should be, right? The, uh, the same in the fight. I don't want anything that's going to take control of me or take the scene where it shouldn't go. 
So, uh, but I want to work on it so that it has sensory reality to me, and then bring it about so that I can believe it, and then the audience will believe it. The point where it does say she strikes it, which is when he says, I am a gentleman, and I say that, I'll try. What we had worked out, which is the one thing that I think we really had set, was that I go to slap him, and he stops me. Does that work? Well, he says, if you, if you, if you strike me, I'll, cu if you, I'll cuff you again. I think you have to hit him there for the next line to make sense. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. Okay. <laughs> no, but don't hurt him. You've got to believe you slap him, but work on it so that you aren't hurting him. Right? Now, um, verbal action. Let me give you an example. If my objective is to make you laugh or to provoke you with a laugh, if I tickle you first and you laugh, I have no need for the words anymore. Um, it's the same with the physicality. The words are already duels. Uh, best beware my sting and a wasp and uh, the, with my tongue in your tail. The scene works much better if you cut the physical attacks to where they are called for in the script and nowhere else, that you will see that it's much easier. I think the weakest thing right now is also your receiving. You yeah. race through it from beginning to end. You aren't really letting something land so that you need to counter. And you both knew each other rather than discovering each other, testing each other finding out about each other with your thrusts. Don't know what he's going to do. See, if you expect something else, how does this take you so that you need to find a counter? Don't go too quickly on tempo. You're going to not find the scene if you do. And I don't mean make deliberate pauses, but really receive before you need to send back and top or undermine or cut or outrage, or startle, or scare, or whatever. And the fun of that when you win, you know? OK, very good. By the way, I just wanted to say on that five minute um, dictum that I give you, is not so I can see a lot of scenes, uh, or more scenes, or deal with more actors. If you take a scene that's more than five minutes, there are exceptions, of course, six minutes, seven and a half or something. But the, the moment you take a scene too long and you have no director, you will intuitively start directing yourself. You say, I can't play this here. I've got to save it for there. You start to shape the scene directorially rather than approaching it subjectively and see how much life you can bring into those five minutes. That's my reason for it, OK? Give it another whack. Okay, good. Thank you. The fifth exercise is called recreating physical sensations. Now, in part one, the sensory responses to visible and tangible objects that have been imaginatively endowed with properties that cannot or should not be real on stage. For instance, I don't want a real hot iron on stage. I might burn myself. Uh, I don't want real steam to come out of an iron on stage. I always tell the story about Mary Ewer, who was ironing in, in Look Back in Anger on Broadway here. And when the steam came out of the iron, first of all, the entire audience said, oh, look, real steam. That's that plugged in. And they left the, the stage. They, they had no reality anymore at all, because suddenly it was real steam. Secondly, she, one night, the steam, she got a steam burn, curtain. She was rushed to the hospital, and the performance was canceled. So, the, those dangerous realities that can control you have to be found not by the reality, but by an endowed reality.
Okay. Okay. Now, that was kind of wonderful. Uh, uh, how did you feel? Um, pretty good. I think I anticipated a bit the, the, the sound. Um, uh, that I wondered about and what... Uh, well, I, I, I can s sort of see that way, but not really because it's night, but only... But directing your attention there, I felt, came before you believed you heard. That was the only thing I would have criticized. Yeah. And I thought, because it became then, it's funny when we do an illustrated uh, action, it makes me speculate, why did she do that? Do you know what I mean? Now, if you had heard something and then looked there, yeah. I would have believed it. And you would have too. Yeah. But that's what you anticipated. Yeah. No, this, I had almost no criticism. And they had wonderful examples. My God, the wet clothes were just superb. And that always these actors who, they have to come in from the rain, so they put their head, head under the tap water first, and then it dip, dip, drips all over the set, but they don't feel really wet anywhere else, you know. But th this was uh, the, uh, exemplary, that, that entrance. And the, uh, the weight of the, the water and the steam and the burning yourself and the chocolate, I mean, it was, I have no criticism, unfortunately. But... Uh, um, Oh, there's one other thing I want to say right at this point, is that all the exercises should ideally set up an automatic rehearsal process so that you rehearse all day long. You don't just rehearse when you set the time for it. I can't, uh, I, I can't go to an oven. Every time I open my oven at home, I see how I go back from the heat. Do you follow? In other words, and, uh, the self-observation involved when you burn yourself, when you touch an iron, at which point you pull back the finger. The, because these are the things that create the reality of the sensation. Can you see from this exercise the endless variations? Opening a bottle that's supposed to be stuck, a sharp knife. I use a dull one and see what happens when it's supposed to be really sharp, so I can't hurt myself. OK, I think that's enough. Very good. Now, the second part of this exercise is where you endow physical sensations through the circumstances. In other words, weather, heat, cold, having to be quiet, being in a hurry. In other words, you're endowing the circumstances with realities which they don't quite have.
Okay. <laughs> what can you tell me? Oh, I screwed up. The match wasn't supposed to light. When <laughs> it, it didn't. Went. No, and it didn't. When you threw the thing, it went out. No, no, I, I lit the match too soon. I oh, had oh. more business with the oh, uh, match. Oh, 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 I see. <laughs> and that, and it, said it lit, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I had to go. Well, I didn't see it, you see. So that didn't matter. You went with what happened. Anything else? Um, the uh, certain the balance wasn't as strong as it was in. No, I didn't think so either. By the way, drunkenness is probably the hardest condition in the world to play without indicating and without uh, uh, illustrating. Uh, and uh, you, you were on that. Sometimes it was wonderful, but it wasn't. Uh, I don't think it was consistent. I don't know why. Was I tried to make it? Um, I wasn't concentrating enough. My head was very heavy. I think what I should have done now that I think of it is put it more in my knees. I think so too. Yeah. I think. In other words, the thing is to localize one area, and each each person, if you've ever been tight or or, uh, or almost drunk at all, uh, it's the hardest one also because when we're drunk, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to be self-observant while you're plastered. <laughs> The, uh, but if you go for one area of your body that is out of control, as one of the most suggestible to me when I'm standing, is my knees. And to allow them, uh, in other words, to, to give in to the desire, uh, to, the, to the fact that they feel wobbly. In other words, to give in to them, but then try to control it. Do you follow? You don't want to be. In other words, what most actors do, or most uh, people who play drunks, is that they want to be out of control, you see. Now, if, if, if your knees, if you're trying to get ahead and your knees go, you want to straighten up. Then your head, then your head starts to carry you back, right? So, but you want the head to be straight. So there's continuously finding the vulnerability and overcoming it with a desire to do it correctly. Right. 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 And uh, it was like there on the, the knees, it was very good. And there was one point here where it was very good, but it was variable. Right? right. The, uh, you had a degree of quiet. Right. You had, uh, um, what else? The bathroom. The, well, the toilet. Oh, yes. OK. <laughs> uh, now, again, yeah. staying drunk is harder sitting. When you sit, it's usually your head that wants to go, that you try to keep straight, you know? And then the attempt for, for normals. I didn't even do that on purpose, you see. Uh, and the attempt to to get uh, and to focus, you see, to get to the right place for this, make sure that that's your cigarette, you know, <laughs> so that the the uh, the attempt is for normalcy. Right. Okay. Now it's very good. Thank you. Thank you. And then I always say, why do I have to work on the exercise? If I say, I'm going to work on, I'm hired to play. <coughs> if I were a young man, to play the young man in uh, Bedtime Story by Sean O'Casey. And his first scene, he is, he's got a lost object. He's looking for a lipstick. It's pitch dark in the room. Uh, it is ice cold in the room. He has to be quiet because the landlady is downstairs. He has to, uh, uh, he spills, a, he knocks over a lamp and he's sopping wet and so forth and so on. There are like six conditioning forces at stake. I don't want to, at that point, learn how to stagger conditions and make them real to myself. I want to work on the character. Do you see what I mean? That's one of the glorious benefits of the object exercises, that we so uh, uh, build such reflexes in the reality of behavior that when we come to the part, we can now concentrate on the part. Okay. She's like a force of nature, but she's not like a, like a like a typhoon or anything. She's like the summer coming, you know? Mm -hmm. You start to realize that it's hot outside, so you take off your jacket, and then it's really hot, and then you gotta take off your shirt, and you hope that your undershirt is okay, you know? And then it gets really hot, and you have to decide whether you're gonna get buck naked or just put a bathing suit on. And you know that if you are not prepared for her, or if you're gonna get ready to waste her time, it's really not a good idea. Now I have, what time is it? Oh, it's already 20 past 10. 
I think we should have, at this point, a question and answer period on where we are. OK? I'll get up there, and you formulate your questions. On anything that has arisen about your scenes, or theory, or anything you like. All right, yes. When you have a scene partner that um, wants you to do something that you feel is illogical, how do you deal with that when you don't have a director? Even when the director is there. If an actor gets illogical, go with him and the illogic. And then it suddenly doesn't fit the dialogue. And then they stop. Let's say an example that I make, which is very visual, so you'll know. If the actor goes out too soon, he has to make an exit. And I have to say, uh, come on, why, why are you leaving? And he's gone already. I don't say, you're leaving too soon, because then he just gets mad at me and thinks I'm directing him. So I let him go. Then I don't say my line. He comes back and says, you didn't say your line. I said, you were gone. <laughs> and then there's no discussion anymore. Yeah. You know, another thing we were just discussing about physical violence on stage, when I was in Streetcar with Tony Quinn, he knocked me black and blue. I mean, he really, and every performance I'd say, Tony, please, I put more makeup on my body than on my face because I'm bruised from head to toe. Well, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I felt it. You know? So this went on for weeks. And one day I was sitting on the desk, and he has to come toward me and shake me. And I saw, saw him come towards me. The thumbs were already out. I knew which muscle they were going to land in, you know. <laughs> and they, sure enough, they did, and they landed. And I went, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow. Oh. And he stopped, and he forgot all his lines. And he went, well, oh, oh. And uh, I, funny, I got him back into the dialogue. And we came off stage, he said, you're not supposed to say that there. I said, I felt it. <laughs> he never hurt me again. <laughs> fun, fun. <laughs> OK, yes, yes. You see, that is totally personal. Wow. It's whatever is stimulating to you. I have on some things thick workbooks, on others a few pages. I make little personal notes about substitutions and transferences that I make. For instance, Virginia Woolf, Martha, who is the daughter of the university president, very strong academic background in terms of her, her life, faculty parties and so on. Well, my father was a professor. I uh, was raised in a, in a faculty uh, atmosphere, in an academic atmosphere. So that in, to substantiate those realities was so, I mean, I just made it direct. It matched. She adored her father, so did I. You know, so that much of it was done. If I go to St. Joan, I'm in a big, I got a big problem. I got a lot of work to do. Do you see? OK. Yes. When is too much too much, or it's never too much? Like Nothing is too much if it has reality. What is too much is pushing, mugging, illustrating, indicating is too much, is wrong. But a full experience, no matter how huge it can be, is not too much, in my opinion. Yes? Because we do a lot of film and television, um, we're faced with the fact that our destination is a mark on the floor. I mean, how do I take that and apply it? The mark on the floor is still either near a table, near a chair. It's not spaceless. So the principle is identical. Why do I go to that table? Then you'll hit your mark more easily, too. OK. Why do I go over there? Right. And that's your own, your, your own I mean, most directors don't give you justification. You've got to find your own anyway. Right, right. In, on stage, too. <laughs> OK, yes. Could you tell the opera story, the one about true intention? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what I always say, if on stage, a true intention, it's like a chorus line. It's the, the, all the chorus girls are lined up. And one of them takes a peek at the audience to see if her agent is there. You know, It's like being shot by a bullet. 
Now everybody is singing and going, and this one person goes, <laughs> and everybody jumps, you know. So uh, the story, Herbert and I went to a dress rehearsal of Lone Green, God help us, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I kept saying, I don't want to go 10 o'clock in the morning to a three-hour opera. I just can't bear it. Herbert said, come on, it'll be interesting. So we went. And on stage, as the curtain went up, there were rocks and levels and later on swans going by and I don't know what all. And people in with singers with horns and the, the furs and then long robes and everything. And there on one of these rocks were tons of extras. And right in front was an extra who had obviously never been on stage in his life and didn't know what he was doing there. So while they're singing and going and carrying on, he had on one of these uh, armor hats, and he had the, uh, the knitted uh, chainmail gloves, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute. And the curtain went up. <laughs> he looked, there were a half a dozen people, and the director and the, the, Mr. Bing, the head of the Met. <laughs> then somebody here sang very loudly, and he went. <laughs> he started looking at the scenery. He started looking at the other. And then, then after he had a lot of looks like this, and we were weeping. <laughs> he got bored with all that stuff that was going on around. And he began to. Then his hat started to bother him. <laughs> it went on an hour, an hour. And then finally the hat couldn't bear it anymore. not to be forgotten. This is all you could see on that stage, no matter how many people were screaming and yelling and choruses were singing and uh, all the hell, swans were moving and lone green and, and all you could see was this man. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Any more? It is now 10 and 1. Let's call it quits. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yes, we're finished now. <laughs>